to More Living with Jim Brogan, your source of information for living the best years of your life, your way. For more than a decade, host Jim Brogan and his expert guests have come together each week to share important news and advice that can impact the lives and well-being of those who are retired and those nearing retirement. Learn about issues like health and fitness, financial planning, social security benefits, investment advice, and more. And now, here's the host of More Living, Jim Brogan. Good morning, East Tennessee, and welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. I want to thank you for tuning in to News Talk 98.7 WOKI. And, you know, Dolly Parton is a name that is synonymous with East Tennessee. We all love her. She is, there's a mysticism and an awe that surrounds Dolly Parton. She's a hero of sorts for those who grew up around here. She is an integral part of the history and economy of our area. And today on our show, we are talking with Jad Abumrod, who spent two years following Dolly Parton around, interviewing her and learning about her life. He produced a nine-series podcast, Dolly Parton's America, which was released this fall. And in the first episode of this podcast series, Jad describes Dolly Parton as a grand unifier, as a force like any other. And I don't know about you, but I think we need unification right now. Uh, Jad grew up in Middle Tennessee, actually, and knew about Dolly Parton as a kid, but he hadn't really thought about the enormity of Dolly until he saw her stadium show in New York, where he lives in 2016. Good morning, Chad. Welcome to More Living. It's great to have you with us. Hey, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Before we dive into the podcast and, and some of the questions I have for you, just first, what birthed the, the idea and kind of set things in motion for you to do this podcast series, Dolly Parton's uh, America? Well, a couple of things. I mean, you sort of, you sort of nodded to it in your intro. Um, it was... Uh, it was hearing a lot of people talk about the experience of going to a Dolly Parton show, uh, where uh, it's it, and people would describe it as one of these few places in America where you just see every kind of person. Uh, you see people on all sides of the political aisle. You see a multiracial audience. You see people of faith standing next to men in drag. You see just all kinds of people, and everybody's just kind of standing next to each other and singing. I will always love you. And there's just something about that image of America at this point that just was really interesting to me. Uh, so it started with a really simple question, which is how has she been able to create this new amalgam space in America? But then it turns out that question leads you onto all kinds of rabbit holes. So I just wanted to know, I just wanted to know, uh, I, you know, I'm very interested in like people who unify right now uh, for obvious reasons. And she just seemed um, to be doing it so effortlessly, and I just wanted to know how. Well, in the time frame, in 2016, you know, the election was really turning ugly uh, leading up to that yeah. fall. And so what what do you think it is about Dolly that just brings so many different people together? Yeah, you know, I mean, that is a that is this sort of, uh, that's the big question uh, that uh, I spent two years trying to answer. And I don't know if I really have one satisfying answer. I mean, she really is kind of like the unicorn of unicorns. But uh, I think it, a lot of it has to do with the fact that she's been, I mean, her longevity. She's been in the public eye for 60 years. I mean, literally, I think her she began, uh, you know, at the Cass Walker show, as you know, uh, 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 at age 11, I want to say. Maybe maybe it's 13. But she, she was on the radio in front of people when she was barely a teenager and then has stayed that way on our televisions and on our radios uh, for the last half century. And so in that time, she's written 5,000 songs. So I think one of the answers to your question is simply her, her how prolific she's been. Everybody has their Dolly song. Uh, so that's one answer. You, you know, um, I kind of wonder, too, uh, it went, and, and I don't, you know, I didn't get to know her. You know, I don't know her the way you got to know her in doing this podcast series. Um, but to me, two words that just ring true is genuine and authentic. You know, that's yeah. the way she comes across to me. And 
And, and to me, that hasn't ever changed. Like, you know, she went from, you know, she was laughed at by her senior class and at Sevierville, you know, when she was graduating, said she was going to be famous. And, but then she became famous and she became bigger and bigger, really much more than just country music. She became a film star. She just became this icon. But to me, she never lost that authenticity and that she, she, she stayed down to earth. I, I don't know. From the outside looking in, that's one reason I would wonder, is that why she's, she's able to unify so many people? Yeah, I think, I think that's it. I mean, I, I think that's a large part of it. I mean, it's funny, you know, in the researching of this podcast, we found, uh, I think, the first recorded interview with Dolly when she was 21 years old. Uh, and, and it's amazing to listen to that because you, what you hear is somebody who, I mean, her voice is completely different. She's a young girl. She's just getting started. She's not that kind of confident Dolly that we all know now, but she's exactly the same person in all other respects. And so it's, it is, there is something that's really true about what you're saying. She just seems absolutely like one of those, like she was born and she was an old wise soul from the very beginning and has stayed that way. But there's something very kind of buoyant and childlike about her that makes you feel kind of joy. I, there's something that has, I don't know. She somehow stands out of time in a way that's really kind of beautiful. Yeah, there's just a, under there's a sense of humility there. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. I'm remember now. This is Jad. This is from my memory bank from years ago. But I remember they Dolly was interviewed, or no, it wasn't her. It was either I think it was Daryl Hannah. It may have been Julia Roberts, but I think it was Daryl Hannah when um, they did an interview after Fried Green Tomatoes. And uh, it may have been, it was a little bit later. It wasn't like right after the movie came out. But um, they were filming the movie. The story, the way I remember it, is they were filming the movie, and it was stifling heat and humidity. It was like in the mid-90s. Humidity was in the mid-90s. It was kind of one of those suffocating days in, that you get in, you know, Columbia, South Carolina, or deep south Georgia, or something like that. And everybody was miserable. And most were complaining and I think it was Daryl Hannah, and she said she looked up on the front porch where they were filming, and Dolly Parton was sitting there in a rocking chair with a little uh, hand fan and just smiling, just sitting there. <laughs> and she asked yeah. her, she asked her, you know, why, are you not miserable? Everybody's just dying over here and, and complaining, and, and you're just sitting up here and just look like you're just loving it, every minute of it. And she said, you know what? When I was a kid, all I ever, and this is the gist of it, but she said, when I was a kid, all I ever wanted to be was a star. And now that I am a star, I always swore I would always appreciate where I was and, and, and what I always wanted to be. And I don't know, that, yeah. that, that's from my memory bank, but that to me seems so Dolly Parton, Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's a, yeah, there's just a, there's, yeah, I think you kind of captured it right there. That's the feeling of sitting with her. She makes you kind of feel that feeling with her. Um, you know, I mean, there's something, I'll just build on one thing you said, you know, you know, those people that have like a contagious laugh, they, they laugh and you can't help but laugh. Sure. Uh, and I don't know, I don't know what that is. It's chemical. It's, it, it's physical. Uh, Dolly, I mean, to sit in an interview with Dolly, whatever that thing is that you just described, that spirit that she has, it is contagious. I mean, she she walks in the room and within ten minutes you're you're just feeling differently. She somehow infects you with her her buoyant joyfulness, and uh, and it's really powerful. It, it sometimes made it hard to do an interview with her because you you just kind of get on the Dolly wavelength so quickly. Yeah, that would be pretty tough. Now, you mentioned in the podcast Dolly's popularity is a measurement of a global Q score. Tell us what that is and what Dolly's score means for her brand and her impact. Yeah, this was interesting to me. So, I mean, one of the first things we encountered, because, uh, you know, as we were trying to talk about Dolly's um, Dolly's reach, you know, because as you mentioned, I grew up in, in Nashville. So for me, Dolly has always been a, a, a Tennessee figure. But actually, she is, as we know, a huge global superstar. And I wanted to figure out how to quantify that. Like, how is it, like, how can we talk about that? Record sales, What like, what's the best way to talk about that? It turns out there's this thing called Q-score, which is a kind of a, a, a measure of brand awareness. And I think what they do is they get a bunch of people into a room and they ask them, 
uh, do you know this celebrity or that celebrity and how do you feel about them? And they do this with thousands of people. And then they develop a thing called a Q-score, which lets you know just like your awareness of this person and then your positive or negative feelings about them. And they add that up into a score. And we were looking at the data and um, Dolly was in the top 10 of Q scores, which doesn't really surprise anyone. I mean, she's one of the biggest stars in, in, on the planet. But if you look at the data, it's interesting. The reason that she's so popular is, or that her Q, Q score is so high is that she has um, very favorable positives, as one would expect. But she was far and away number one when it comes to lack of negatives. Uh, so nobody yeah. had a had a mean word to say about her, which is amazing to think about for someone who's been in the public eye for sixty years. She has no baggage. Yeah, that's pretty Everybody amazing. Has baggage. Yeah, that's remarkable right? to think about. But you're right; I've never heard anything negative. And and now you had, right. you had mentioned that it was in it was in though your first interview that you really realize she is so much bigger than just a singer songwriter in Dollywood, right? Where you yeah. just kind of hit you that this is a mega worldwide phenomenon, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it, you know, what, one of the things that, you know, I mean, one of the premises of the whole podcast series, and, you know, we spend nine episodes talking not just about Dolly Parton's life, but about America as seen through Dolly Parton, right? And one of the first um, things that I realized is to sit down with Dolly Parton and talk with her. Um, you 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 realize you're talking to a historical figure. This is somebody who is who has touched every social movement of the past half century. You know, she wrote songs in 1967 about what was happening around her in her community in East Tennessee, and. That these are almost like journalistic accounts of of life uh, in 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 that world, and so you. It was really immediately apparent to me that like she is almost like a history book in musical form of America, because we would start to talk and um, and suddenly she'd be telling me about murder ballads, which. Probably uh, folks who've grown up in East Tennessee know about quite well, but for me, having grown up in Middle Tennessee, I'd never heard of a like the Knoxville Girl, right? That song, that popular song that people sing. Uh, if you look at the lyrics, it's a crazy song. And I was, like, what is this song about a man walking with his girlfriend and then beating her with a stick and throwing her in a river? What? What? And yes. so then I would suddenly want to like do research about murder battles, and that leads you into an entire world of stories and ideas well, same thing happened when we started talking about nine to five i mean everything was like a rabbit hole yeah right everything goes in a lot of different directions we're visiting with jada boomrod he is the uh who ran the nine series podcast dolly parton's america it's really fascinating when we come back we're going to talk about all things dolly we're going to talk about the iconic song i will always love you and get jad's perspective on all on, on its impact after getting to know dolly so don't go away as we visit about really uh, one of the greatest icons that, that that we've ever seen maybe ever seen come out of this area dolly parton as you listen to more living with jim brogan right here on news talk 98 7 woki you are listening to more living with jim brogan during the week, Jim is a financial advisor, an author and speaker with an MBA from the University of Tennessee who specializes in helping people in or near retirement plan for the next phase of their lives. You can reach Brogan Financial during the week at 865-862-6800 or on the web at broganfinancial.com. And now, here's Senior Market Advisor Magazine's 2011 National Advisor of the Year and host of More Living. Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm your host, Jim Brogan, and we're visiting with Jad Aboomrod. He has produced the non-series podcast, non-podcast series, uh, Dolly Parton's America. It's really fascinating, and uh, I was kind of laughing with my producer off the air there, Jad, uh, when I was talking about the movie. It wasn't Fried Green Tomatoes, Good Night. It was uh, Still Magnolias was the movie. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I got that completely mixed up. You know, two, anyway, got, got really mixed up. Both set in the Deep South, for sure. 
But uh, at any rate, we're visiting with Jad and talking to him about the impact of Dolly Parton, who is such, a, su- such an icon around these parts for sure, but really all around the world. And uh, more than a few times through your interviews with her, Jad, she said, ask me what you want to ask me. I'm going to tell you what you want to hear with laughter. What's that like? What, what, how did you respond to that? I mean, to talk, tell our audience. Yeah, I mean, she started a few of our interviews that way, uh, uh, and I think what she what she what she what what she means, and certainly this was my experience talking to her, is that you, Dolly, is such a such a charismatic storyteller, uh, and so skilled in an interview that um, she basically, in the gentlest uh, way, will take control of every interview, and so you end up. You end up asking her a question, and then suddenly she's telling you the most magnificent story, and she's singing. She starts to sing in the middle of interviews, and it's so enchanting that you completely lose your train of thought. And and uh, and then uh, suddenly she's telling you what she wants you to hear, but rather than answering the question that you asked her, and it's not manipulative. It's just it's just she's that she's just one of those presences. She's so charismatic that it, it makes it really hard to ask her like a tough question. Because uh, she's so enchanting to sit with. Yeah, well, I mean that's the gr- that's the I mean that's the crux of a great interviewee. Someone who does great interviews is they're going to always control the conversation one way or another. They're going to get it going where they want it to go. But that's yeah, so funny because I, you know, I wouldn't have necessarily pegged that that would be what, the way she would you know the way she would lead. Um, I mean, I'm not surprised, but it just it is a little surprising now. I mentioned before the break there, one of her most famous, maybe her most famous songs, I Will Always Love You. And it, it's actually been at the top of the charts in four different decades. It's been one of the yeah. most, and, and of course it was written about one of the most painful parts in her life when she made the decision to part ways with her longtime partner, Porter Wagner. And it's been remade multiple times, and of course most famously, Whitney Houston in The Bodyguard. Why do you think the song has made such an impact? I mean, there's been a lot of great songs over the years that have been remade. I don't think I don't know that there's any been anything quite like that song. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I mean, it's it's so uh that's a really good question. I mean, it's a uh it, it, it's a song that's about that's about separating from someone. Uh but also doing it with grace and with forgiveness. And I think there's something so pure about its intent and its sentiment. Um, you know, there's so many songs in, in pop music that are about loves that didn't work out uh, or relationships that didn't work out. But there's some way in which there's like a there's a um, an adversarial tone to it. And, and I think I mean, for me, at least, because I guess I can only re- really answer personally. What's so moving about that song and the story behind it is, is just how um, how graceful and how Dolly, in separating from Porter, never talked bad about him, always chose to take the higher road with him, always chose to forgive him, to help him when he needed help later in his life. And so there's something very pure and almost Christ-like about the, uh, the stance that, is, that she takes with him, and I think you feel that in that song. I agree with you on completely on that. Now, uh, her songwriting, and you've touched on all the different elements, uh, or many of the different elements, but her lyrics and storytelling really are quite remarkable. And sometimes they're sad, sometimes they're upbeat, sometimes they're almost prophetic. And during one episode of the podcast, a guest said that if Dolly had been a songwriter in another era, she would have been like a Mozart. Mm. You know, how... How her songs and lyric do you think changed the landscape for songers and songwriters and singers that have followed her? Yeah, I mean that's a great question, and uh, that's a great question. I, you know, I think let me put it to you this way: uh, that was Robert Orman who said that uh, that she would be Mozart had she been born in a different era. Also, I mean, I, w- I would just tag that with with the thought that she had she not been kind of the backwards Barbie persona that sometimes gets presented in the media, you know, this sort of this kind of like larger than life uh, larger than like this had we not been so focused on her presentation and her physique we might have recognized that she was as great a songwriter as Mozart or Gershwin or Dylan or any of these people that we talk about, Uh, but I don't think she's been given the credit that she deserves just as a pure songwriter 
Um, but her, as for her influence, um, I don't know. It's a it's a tricky question because there's something so particular and so singular about Dolly, uh, from the output to the way that she sings. Uh, it's almost like she's influenced everyone, but not not in a way that you can particularly hear. Uh, because she is so singular, like the way that she sings is such a singular sound that you don't hear a lot of people singing like Dolly. I don't think they can if they even wanted to. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm not exactly sure how she's influenced everybody. I, I, I do think that as I think any female artist coming after Dolly probably will has to give a nod to Dolly. She blazed the path on so many levels, you know, I uh, think country that's, and beyond. I think that's interesting what... Um you know, the, there's there's this caricature almost of her, and I think that's interesting that there's such a depth to so many of her songs, and sometimes that's overlooked by the caricature of her, which I think is kind yeah. of interesting. Um, and then I think with her voice to me, Jad, and I know you you're a musician too. Um, I'm a musician. I was actually a music major in college, um, so we kind of have some things in common there. But to me, there's a purity. And uh, in her voice, there's almost like an innocence and a purity in it that hasn't changed as she's grown older. And I think that's kind of unusual. Uh, most, you know, yeah. that have that that childlike innocence and purity in their voice, you know, it changes as they get into their 30s. But hers yeah. just has that. I don't know. Do you think I what do you think? No, no, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you listen to a song like Love is Like a Butterfly and it's just there's something just absolutely angelic and pure and. In just in the tonality of her voice, there's something so it's like hard to even define what that is. You know, it's interesting, Jim. There was a, a person at Princeton who tried to do an analysis of Dolly's voice, like a real technical analysis of the actual harmonics in her voice. And this person claims that one of the qualities that gives Dolly's voice everything you were just describing is that she has very pronounced high harmonics. They give it that kind of shrill, piercing, pure sound that that you can sometimes sounds very childlike. Sometimes it sounds very emotional and sad. Uh, sometimes it sounds ethereal and angelic. But it's always because it's just very particular in the high register, uh, which I thought was interesting. But yeah, I think as it's grown older, it's gone from a kind of softness to a very like there's a powerful kind of she can impart a powerful edge to it. Uh, while maintaining that vulnerability, I think you know Dolly has always been about vulnerability to me in the way that I she think sings. that's a big word. I think that's a very on point word. And in, in when I think of her, we're visiting with Jad Abumrad, who produced the nine part series Dolly Parton's America, and it's just fascinating. Uh, when we come back, we can't talk about Dolly Parton with getting into Dollywood and rural Appalachia and uh, this what Jad refers to in the podcast series is Tennessee Mountain Trance. What all does that mean? So we're going to kind of go back to her roots and talk some about that. We're also going to have our dollars and cents segment. We just this week saw the most sweeping retirement account legislation in a long, long time. How's it going to impact you? So don't go away as we have uh, it. Stay tuned to more living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI weekly radio show, television news appearances, and adult education classes taught at the University of Tennessee and Pellissippi State Community College. Jim taps into his extensive knowledge and experience to address issues important to living your best retirement. Join Jim every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI and visit him online at broganfinancial.com. And now, here's the host of More Living, Jim Brogan. We're visiting this morning with Jad Abumrad, and we're talking about all things Dolly Parton. As Jad uh, just produced the nine-part series, Dolly Parton's America, it's quite fascinating. And as you listen to more living right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI, before, we're going to talk about Dollywood here in a minute in rural Appalachia. Uh, before we get back to Jad, it is time for Dollars and Cents. Want to be sure you are getting the most out of your retirement? For all the years of your retirement? That's the primary goal of More Living with Jim Brogan and our Dollars and Cents segment, where we provide you with an important financial tip that will help positively impact the quality of your life in retirement. And now, here's Jim with this week's Dollars and Cents tip. 
We've seen the most sweeping retirement account legislation in years. Just happened this week. Uh, how the IRS treats IRAs, 401ks, and other retirement accounts. What do you need to know? And we'll dive into this more as we're able to really dissect the bill. It was attached. The SECURE Act, which was passed by the House of Representatives in May, was attached to the new spending bill in the Senate this week, Thursday. And uh, it was expected to be signed into law yesterday before midnight. Uh, I don't see a confirmation that it was signed into law. It's compl- the White House has indicated it will sign it into law. And it's tr- it, it got a couple of really big factors here. One is they're raising the the age at which you have to start taking distributions of your retirement accounts, your required minimum distribution. They're raising that to 72 years old. So that's a big change. Uh, I mentioned uh, in the last couple of weeks, the IRS is also changing the tables to uh, in terms of how they compute the math. All in all, it gives you more planning opportunities, especially when you're in that sweet spot between retirement and age 72, when you lose some of your tax control because you have these forced taxable distributions from your retirement accounts. So you've, it's, it, we're increasing that sweet spot between, but depending on when you were born, either one or two years. So that's tremendous planning opportunity. For those of you younger workers, there's going to be more flexibility to do more things with 401k. With combining plans, with uh, offering pension type annuity payouts, which is somewhat controversial. Some people don't like annuity pension payouts. Some people do. We'll dive and unpack that a little bit into January. Uh, but ultimately, they're making more flexible options. Now, uh, they'll also let you continue to contribute to IRA after age 70 and a half, or what will now be age 72, if you have earned income, you can continue to contribute to a deductible IRA. In the past, you have not been able to do that. Now, the flip side is, the negative, is that the IRS has taken away a longstanding promise, and that is how you pass your retirement accounts to your heirs. They now cannot stretch the distributions from your retirement account across their remaining lifetime. However, they also do not have to cash the account in all at once. I've talked about this extensively on this show and in my classes and in my office. Uh, Leaving retirement accounts to your kids is the most overlooked area in estate planning. You're leaving your kids an income tax time bomb. And according to the IRS, over 90% of the time, These IRAs are cashed in when the second spouse dies. And you didn't pay the income tax. So who pays the income tax? It's going to be your heirs. And it used to be your heirs could take distributions over their remaining lifetime. If they're 50, they could take it over 32, 33, 34 years and stretch the tax bill across 30-plus years. Now they're going to have to take it over 10 years. So that's still not horrible. Uh, You still need to plan on how you're going to pass your retirement accounts, but it's not as friendly as it was. So you need to be looking at your overall tax planning and your overall IRA distribution planning. For example, once you're in your 70s, how are you doing qualified charitable distributions to take full advantage of the law and get a tax deduction from your required minimum distribution in addition to your standard deduction? You know, if you're, or, or if even if you're itemizing, you get that plus you get the, the, the contribution to charity. Uh, how you time and how you plan giving your assets to your kids and how you leave them, this creates greater implications for the taxes at death. They're just, it, it's still not horrible, but it's not as flexible. So how you bequest other assets that get more favorable tax treatment, like, you know, highly appreciated stock or real estate or other investments. And then a third thing is how you implement Roth conversion, especially when you're in that sweet spot between retirement age and age 72, uh, when you've got a lot of tax control and you can maybe keep Roth conversion tax rates at maybe 10 or 12 percent or capital gains tax rates at zero percent. It just underscores the need for you to have a coordinated financial plan that includes tax planning and income planning and estate planning. So stay tuned as we'll have more of this as we get into January and unpack the details in the new SECURE Act that was part of the spending bill passed this week. 
That's our Dollars and Cents segment for this week. You can find this week's Dollars and Cents segment and others by visiting BroganFinancial.com. And please do check us out at BroganFinancial.com. You can follow us at Twitter and Facebook. You can also sign up for my weekly e-blast, e-newsletter, where I just provide you links to all the content I'm producing to keep you informed so you can make prudent decisions to impact the quality of your life. That's what this show is all about. That's about what I do in the community with the classes help you make informed decisions that are smart decisions. The plan that gets you to retirement is not the plan that will get you through to re- through retirement. Go to BroganFinancial.com to sign up for all this information or to download resources that we have at the website. Today on The More Living, we are visiting with Jad Abumrod, and he just finished the nine-part podcast series, Dolly Parton's America. Of course, she's such an icon all over the world, but particularly in this area where she grew up. And uh, we got to talk about Dollywood, Jad. Around here, the center of Dollyverse is Dollywood. However, it's more than just a theme park with amusement rides. Dollywood, in many ways, is the story of Dolly's childhood. So what did you learn about Dolly and the history of the park and her vision to create in creating Dollywood? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting, Jim. I mean, she, uh, you know, the first time she ever mentioned the idea, it was 1983 or two, I believe. She was talking to Barbara Walters in an interview, and she just kind of threw out the idea, you know, I... I, I'd like to create a city in the Smoky Mountains that's sort of like Disneyland, but a kind of fantasy world that's very particular to the Smokies. And I want to call it Dollywood. And, she, you know, I, I have no idea what prompted that idea in her mind. As far as I know, she hadn't had any investment toward that end. So it, it was it literally, I think, was just an idea. But then within a few years, you know, some folks, uh, the Hershens uh, who ran Silver Dollar City before Dollywood, uh, I guess heard that interview, and then partnered with her, and created this created this world. Um, and you know, I mean, it is as you say, the a kind of almost uh, bringing to life of Dolly's childhood story, but also a lot of uh, history and crafts from the uh, Appalachian region, and uh, and uh, it, it has become. I mean, you know, I think there's an analysis done at the University of Tennessee. It's one point five billion dollars of economy injected wow. into that into that area, uh, so it's become really, I mean, something much much bigger than just a, a story about Dolly or a park about Dolly. Yeah, it really is, and it it attracts people from all over. And then you've got all the stuff that goes with that, and the Dixie Stampedes out there, and it's just so much fun. Now you've talked several times about the Tennessee Mountain trance and how it really grabbed you when you visited Dolly's childhood homestead. So describe what you mean by the Tennessee mountain trance. You know, I was, I was referring to the, uh, initially when I used that, that term in the podcast, I was referring to the experience of talking to Dolly Parton in an interview and how she, she puts you into a trance. Uh, she starts to tell these stories, uh, about, about the Tennessee mountain home and about growing up in the Smokies and uh, and she start she'll start to kind of sing the songs that her mother sang to her in an interview, and it's just really intoxicating to sit there and be in her presence and to listen to those stories. And um, she sort of draws you into her trance in a way. So initially, I was referring to that, but then you know I, I was very fortunate. Her nephew and bodyguard Brian Seaver uh, took uh, myself and my producer Shima Oliai. Uh, took us to the actual Tennessee Mountain Home, which is on the other side of, uh, of the mountain from where Dollywood is. And, um, and that was an entirely different kind of Tennessee Mountain Trance And that, for me, it was a really powerful experience because, you know, I'm a, I'm a Lebanese-American, and so I, I grew up in Nashville, but I never really felt like I was a part of, of the core Nashville culture. But the the thing that I immediately recognized was just how similar in landscape and topography that house was to the to the to the little house uh, that my dad grew up in in the mountains of Lebanon. And it was a really interesting moment where I saw that, and I, I subsequently ended up talking to him about this and talking to her about his story and him about her story. And it was a it was a moment where I realized that that trance actually is not just 
regional to East Tennessee. I mean, I think there's something about Dolly's story and, and about that story of growing up in the mountains that I think translates all across the world. Yeah, and I think Dolly, there's a... As we know, is, well, sorry, I, I, well, I just think there's a rawness and honesty with her music with, you know, a lot of people can identify with her childhood poverty and the struggle that she had to make her life better and that we have to make our lives better. Yeah, I think I think that's right. And, you know, that story that she tells of coming down the mountain, right, and conquering the world, um, that's the story of any migrant. That's the story of any immigrant, really. Absolutely. Uh, so I think she she's singing songs about home on behalf of a lot of people, not just yeah. people where she's from. Absolutely. Now, we, can, we also can't talk about Dolly Parton without talking about her philanthropy and her passion for helping kids read. So when we come back, we're going to talk some about that as we visit with Jada Boomrod, uh, who produced the podcast series Dolly Parton's America. Stay tuned. You're listening to More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Thank you for listening to More Living with Jim Brogan. If you miss any of today's show or want to listen to it again, visit BroganFinancial.com where you can access the podcast and other educational materials to help you in your journey through retirement. And now, here's Senior Market Advisor Magazine's 2011 National Advisor of the Year and host of More Living, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI. We're visiting with Jad Aboomrod, who produced the podcast series Dolly Parton's America. Uh, if you missed part of the interview, you can catch more. We'll have it up on our website by Monday. Uh, you can listen to all of our podcasts there. You can also uh, follow us at YouTube. You can download it at iTunes. Uh, whatever you like, but uh, if you miss part of that, you definitely want to catch the whole interview. And uh, Jad, you know, she's known, Dolly Parton is known as a philanthropist. Her Imagination Library Program has given tens of millions of books to young children all around the country. Generation, generosity and kindness are really adjectives that many people would use to describe Dolly Parton. Can you talk a little bit about that part of her life and how passionate she is about literacy and young people? Yeah, I mean, you know, Dolly told me that, you know, she hopes that one of her legacies, even beyond her music, is that she'll be known as the book lady, uh, which for someone who's written 5,000 songs, that's quite a statement, that that, acts, that that will be the thing that she hopes to be remembered for. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the the Imagination Library program, which really is extraordinary, uh, I think began because her, her dad couldn't read, but was incredibly smart and incredibly business savvy, but was always a little bit held back by uh, not being able to read, you know, contracts and those kinds of things. And she didn't want to repeat that uh, in her community. And so, you know, her philanthropy, I think, grew out of initially... Uh, supporting kids in uh, Sevier County High School, and then it grew into the Imagination Library program where every kid up until the age of five, I believe, I could have that wrong, gets a book from age from birth to, to age five, which is an extraordinary commitment to, uh, to, uh, to that community. Yes, and it also is. it's become it's become the literacy, the default literacy program in a lot of communities in the Deep South, and also now overseas. You know, I was in... Uh, the UK for uh, Dolly's premiere of Nine to Five the Musical, and I met with a lot of uh, folks there where they use the Imagination Library as the only kind of book source uh, in their communities, which is pretty amazing. That Dolly has become a kind of infrastructure for a lot of these uh, these places that don't that don't invest in it from a federal level. Uh, so it it really is actually more important than than can really even be. Uh, you can't really overestimate how important that program is to a lot of places. Oh, I think her impact in the next 50 years, that, 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 that will probably be her biggest impact in how it has shaped America. And, and, and it's just in, remarkable what she's done there. Uh, now, there's actually a class, Jad, that's offered at the University of Tennessee titled Dolly Parton's America. And you focused on the class in one of your podcast episodes. What is the class about, and what can we take? A, and what they're what are they working on in that class? What can we take away from it? Yeah, this was the class that really um, gave us the confidence to do a a series because um, you know I I visited that class several times, and and they 
so it's, it's essentially a history class. This is a class taught by a professor, Lynn Sacco, uh, at the University of Tennessee, and she's a history teacher. She was asked to create a class uh, that would teach uh, sophomores, juniors, and seniors the, the core, like, basic elements of doing history. Just, you know, the boring stuff, like what is a primary source? What is a secondary source? These kinds of questions that a historian has to, has to, has to just know. And she wanted the class to mean something to these kids. And so she, uh, she ended up, after seeing Dolly give that very famous graduation speech at the University of Tennessee, she decided to make Dolly the focus. And so what these kids end up doing is looking at everything that Dolly has said in the media, all of her appearances on various television shows, the things she's written in her autobiography, and using that as a platform to dive into the larger history of East Tennessee and also Appalachia in general. And so the class ends up, so they have to write a paper essentially, a 10 to 15 page paper uh, through the course of the class answering the question, what is Dolly Parton's America? But that ends up for these kids being uh, largely a question about what is the history of their region and how does Dolly tie into that? And it's a really fascinating experience to read those essays because these are incredibly smart kids uh, that I are really struggling with you know the his- how, how Appalachia is seen from the outside. Yeah, well, I think that's a great way that that professor uh, went at, went at the extra mile to try to energize and and give her cl- her her students enthusiasm on on how to learn what they really want to be learning and make it so. Uh, so relevant. Hey, Jad, uh, we're about out of time. How can people follow you? How can they follow the podcast series Dolly Parton's America? Sure, they can. They can. Uh, they can uh, download all the Dolly Parton's America episodes at dollypartonsamerica dot com. They can also follow me at my name. Uh, so at, on Twitter at j a d a b u m r a d at Jad Abumrad. Uh, and uh, anything that I'm up to, they can they can check into there. Okay, so dollypartonsamerica.com and then Jad at Boomrod, uh, or at Twitter symbol. So uh, thank you yeah. so much for being with us. Uh, it, it really is a fascinating podcast. I'm, I'm a little ways into it. I've got more to do. I'm definitely going to listen to the rest of them. It's really fascinating for those of you that haven't heard it. Um, man, what an iconic person. And, Jad, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to spend time with us and get us up to date on what uh, what you did with Dolly. Thank you so much, Jim. This is a real pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That's Jad Abumrod. Uh, again, you can follow uh, his podcast series on Dolly Parton at dollypartonsamerica.com. Uh, we have our upcoming classes. Our uh, registration is open now. My next class is at the University of Tennessee, two-part series through their adult education, Financial Survival for Retirement. You can actually go to financialsurvivalforretirement.com. It's on January 30th and and February the 6th, then I'll be at Pellissippi in March. Find my entire upcoming schedule at BroganFinancial.com. You can also follow us at Twitter and Facebook, and you can sign up for our e-newsletter blast. Thank you so much for tuning in. We've really decided, to just really focused on an iconic life of Dolly Parton because a greater sense of community and oneness and coming together provides for more living so you can live the best years of your life your way. Thank you for tuning in with us today, and have a very... Blessed Merry Christmas this week. God bless you. The views expressed by Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.